All right, thanks everyone for coming to the uh, seminar today. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Jenna Stearns visiting us today from UC Davis. Uh, Jenna's a labor economist and health economist who's done a fair, fair amount of work on uh, family-friendly policies. Uh, she's published uh, already this early in her career in top field journals and great general journals as well. She's published in Labor Economics, Journal of Health Economics, the Journal of Economic Perspectives, and we won't yet speak of this. <laughs> where we live, where this may go. But thanks so much for coming here today, Jenna, uh, to present Equal But uh, Inequitable Who Benefits from Gender Neutral Tenure Clock Stopping Policies. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks, Joe, for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here. and. Uh, to talk to you today about some research with um, co-authors Heather Antical at Claremont McKenna College and Kelly Bedard at UC Santa Barbara. In this paper, we look at a different type of family-friendly policy than the ones you may be most familiar with. Um, a policy that instead of giving uh, new parents access to time away from work, or paid time away from work, gives them uh, access to a benefit that's intended to change the way we think about or measure productivity around the birth of a child. And this type of policy might be especially important for high-skill uh, workers whose uh, uh, subjective or objecti uh, objective evaluations um, for promotion in the future are based on productivity over the course of a career and not necessarily just productivity based on uh, the last month they were on at work or the amount of time that they were physically present at work. So tenure clock stopping policies are a very particular type of policy. They're policies that only apply to assistant professors who are on the tenure track at typically research universities where there's a strong research component associated with getting tenure. So this is a very specific policy and a very specific population that we're going to focus on. In this work, we're going to focus on the effects of these tenure clock stopping policies on the career outcomes of assistant professors of economics. And that's an even more specific group of people. <laughs> so this, you know, this is a really a very particular setting. Um, I'll talk at the end about why we might think it's generalizable uh, or not to other settings. But before I go into the details of the policy and what we're actually going to do, I wanted to start with some motivation about why we might think that this type of policy that changes the way we think about how to measure productivity around the birth of a child may be important for high school workers more generally. OK. so. There's a lot of work um, that's been done on uh, family gaps or gender gaps in labor market outcomes between men and women. Um, and the idea of a family gap is that many of the gender gaps in labor market outcomes are driven by or correlated with the presence of children in the household or the expectation of the costs associated with having children in the future. And so this drives women to make different decisions over the course of their career than men that can potentially lead to um, gender gaps in, in things we care about, like earnings or labor force participation. So women are typically underrepresented in many high skill professions uh, at labor market entry, and they become more underrepresented as they age. This family gap grows as women en enter into and surpass their prime childbearing years. Uh, so this graph just takes data from the 2000 census and the 2010 ACS and plots for the 1970 cohort. So for men and women born in 1970, the share of workers in four high school occupations with advanced degrees, um, the share of women in that occupation, and then the yellow bars are the uh, share of women among the top quartile of earners within that, pro uh, that profession at age 30 and then again at age 40. So here we have uh, lawyers with uh, JDs, doctors with MDs, post-secondary teachers. Um, we can't in the census see uh, college professors in particular, but this is uh, in part college professors with PhDs and then um, people in business occupations with MBAs. And what you can see is that between age 30 and 40, the share of women in these occupations declines. This corresponds with the start of their prime childbearing years for high school women who typically delay fertility until their early to mid 30s. And potentially more important than that 
the share of women in the top quartile of the earnings distribution in these age-specific occupation categories declines as well. So this means even conditional in remaining in the profession or the occupation, women are not moving up within that profession at the same rate as men. And this has really important implications for when we think about the gender gap in, um, in earnings or in wages, because even conditional on occupation, we still see these gaps. Women are still less likely to move up. So why might this be the case? Um, many of these high skill occupations, including the four I just showed you, are characterized by career trajectories that have rapid periods of human capital accumulation early on in one's career and steep and rigid promotion tracks early on in one's career. We often refer to these um, steep promotion ladders or promotion tracks as up or out type environments where if you fail to move up within the job or within the firm at a prescribed rate, it's very hard to move up in the future um, or to keep your job at all. And so the best example of this is, of course, the, the tenure system in academia, where you go up for tenure at a fixed point in time. If you don't uh, get tenure, you don't get to try again the next year. You're out of a job. Okay, if you get tenure, then you get to keep moving up the ladder, or you get the opportunity to try to keep moving up the ladder in the future. You know, tenure may be the, the most well-known example, but we see the same sort of up or out environment in law with people on the partner track, in medicine with the progression up the ranks through hospitals, um, and certain types of business occupations as well. So this is a fairly common uh, career structure for high-skilled professionals. Um, this type of steep promotion track or up or out type structure might be particularly costly for women whose prime childbearing years often correspond quite well with the steep parts of these career ladders. So if women want to invest in starting a family, they often have to make a choice between investing in, in starting a family or investing in their career, and they can't just delay their career into the future, right? They, if they're in kind of this one-shot world where if they don't move up now, they can't do it later, then they can't really decide to take a break from work and, and invest more once they're done having kids. And so this is, this is really a problem in allowing women to maintain the same career trajectories as men. Additionally, even though uh, high skill workers in general are more likely to have access to employer provided family leave benefits like paid family leave, the ability to have more flexible hours outside the nine to five schedule, the ability to work part time, um, Short types of family leave policies or policies that change the hours where you have to be physically present in the office don't adequately often account for the fact that having a child is very costly in terms of lost productivity. And the productivity loss associated with starting a family or having a child may persist beyond the uh, prescribed amount of the benefit. So for example, with paid family leave, maybe you get six weeks or three months of time away from work. The productivity loss associated with starting a family persists beyond that. Additionally, um, in these high school professions, as I said earlier, women are often judged based on productivity over an entire career and not productivity based on the amount of time they, where they were physically present at work. And so even if they're technically allowed to take a short amount of paid family leave, or if they're allowed to reduce their hours for a certain period, it's still going to have negative career consequences when they're evaluated based on this measure of lifetime productivity. So because of this, having children uh, may be expected to reduce the probability that women are, are promoted um, throughout the course of their career, because early productivity still falls falls even in the presence of these types of family-friendly policies. So we want to think in this paper about a different type of family-friendly policy. One that instead of providing workers with time away from work, a time where they don't have to be physically present in the office, changes how uh, evaluators, employers, are supposed to evaluate productivity in the period surrounding childbirth. Okay, and we're going to do this by looking at tenure clock stopping policies. Tenure clock stopping policies are policies that give assistant professors on the tenure clock or on the tenure track um, an additional year on their tenure clock if they have a child. 
Um, we're going to be focused mostly in this paper on policies that are gender neutral, meaning that both new mothers and new fathers get the additional time on their tenure clock when they have a kid, regardless of any actual childbearing responsibilities. But I'll talk a little bit about differences between uh, policies that apply to both men and women and policies that only affect birth mothers um, in just a minute. These policies, these tenure clock stopping policies, were implemented in universities starting um, in about the, the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, partially in response to the growing, uh, the growing awareness of a problem with gender inequality in um, academia. Universities were becoming more and more aware, and the public also was becoming more and more aware of gender gaps in tenure rates, not only in economics, but across um, all disciplines and all fields within universities. And potentially more importantly than that, uh, the gender gaps in tenure rates for parents, for assistant professors who had kids before going up for tenure, was considerably larger, again, across fields, than the gender gap in tenure rates for assistant professors who didn't have kids before tenure. There was still a gender gap, it just wasn't quite as large. Yeah. So two, two questions. One is, did, did these policies start appearing first in, in, pu in public institutions or private institutions? What was the, was it the political process or the market that kind of dro drove this? And then second, has there been any sort of, I know there's not a formal tenure type policy in, 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 in law, right? Yeah. But have there, any, have there been sort of comparable type policies that have been adopted across these other professions at the comparable times? Good question. Um, so the earliest adopters of policies that only applied, tenure clock stopping policies that only applied to birth mothers were at Stanford and Princeton in the early 70s. The next policy, oh, so our sample is going to be the top 50 research universities in the US with PhD programs. Um, the next policies occurred in 1988 um, with the UC. Uh, and then after that, they started uh, becoming quite common um, in the early 90s and were implemented throughout the 90s and 2000s at a pretty steady rate. Um, so there wasn't you know, one catalyst and then everyone suddenly adopted these policies. There's quite a large variation in the timing of implementation, implementation which we're going to actually leverage in this paper. Um, in other fields, we're starting to see more firm specific policies that are kind of designed to do something similar. So some law firms are starting to kind of reevaluate how productivity is measured when making partner decisions. So for a long time, you made partner by having the most possible billable hours over the course of your time at the law firm. And if you took parental leave, it was strongly discouraged to begin with. But there was no kind of compensation for that. You were still expected over the course of your career to have the same number of billable hours. So we're starting to see in a very select number of firms, I think, policies that kind of mirror this, which are intended to essentially say you're not expected to have billable hours if you're on maternity leave, or you're not expected to keep working 120 hours a week right after you have a child. They're less formalized um, as far as I can tell so far, but I think you know, kind of the next step in family-friendly policies is going to be more formalized versions of, of some of these things. Um, again, similar in business, we're starting to kind of see some firms try and, and institute similar policies that change how people are evaluated, but they're, they're much less common than in this setting so far, um, at least to my knowledge. Um, I'll show you a little bit later when I talk about the data, I can show you um, the, the actual timing of the, the, universe, the implementation of these policies in our sample. Okay, so, um, so universities implemented these tenure clock stopping policies in part as a response to the idea that having kids is very costly, right? Uh, and it's particularly costly for assistant professors where a negative productivity shock right before your tenure evaluation has a more negative impact on your career than that same negative productivity shock after tenure, okay? So um, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with the tenure system, but, but the way tenure works is essentially um, you're hired on, on kind of a contingent contract um, and universities, before making you um, 
a permanent employment offer want to essentially get a better signal of your true ability or your true pro productivity. And so in your pre-tenure period or in your pre-tenure period, you're an assistant professor, you typically have six or seven years to essentially uh, give the department a better signal of your true ability, your true productivity. And so to the extent that what departments are trying to figure out is how productive you're going to be in the future, right? if they give you a permanent employment contract, are you going to keep working at the same rate, then basing it off of a negative temporary productivity shock, such as your productivity right after you have a kid or right around the time where you have a kid, doesn't make a lot of sense. So universities um, are not necessarily implementing, implementing these policies because they think that women should have to do less work, um, but instead because they really think that to some extent the productivity shock associated with childbearing is temporary. And we don't want to pick up that noisy signal in the tenure evaluation. Okay, so these policies are really intended to account for the fact that this is a temporary shock. Tenure clock stopping policies are adopted at the university level. They're not adopted in specific departments. Um, so that's going to be important here. Um, and they allow assistant professors to stop or extend their tenure clock for one year um, per birth event. Uh, so typically, assistant professors can stop their clock up to tw two times, meaning that if they would have gone up for tenure after six years in the absence of a policy and they have two kids, they can now go up for tenure after eight years. So they get two additional years in which they can try and publish their, their scholarly works. Um, in theory, these policies are supposed to be costless in the sense that the additional time on the tenure clock is not supposed to count against you. Tenure evaluators, so the people in your department voting on your tenure case and outside letter writers, are supposed to be told um, to disregard or discount the additional time. So if you took eight years and the traditional tenure clock is six, they're supposed to be told to evaluate you as if you had only been there six years. You're not supposed to be penalized in any way um, for getting the extra time. In practice, this doesn't necessarily work as intended, um, and I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Uh, and that's part of why we might expect these policies to not work quite as well as they're intended. The other important thing I should mention is that tenure clock stopping policies are independent of leave taking. They're not tied to going on a leave of absence, to going on paid or unpaid leave for any period of time. They're not tied to course reduction policies or reductions in service. They're not tied to sabbatical, etc. Um, all you have to do to qualify is have a child. Okay, and this is important for two reasons. One, again, there should be no cost to taking these, these take up of these benefits. You're not losing income, for example. You don't have any less of a, of a voice in the department necessarily. And two, um, they should be relatively costless for universities. If the university's goal is to have someone to teach a set number of courses and they need a body to teach those courses, they don't really care if they extend your employment contract one year or they hire someone else in that same employment contract. Okay, so in this sense, these, these policies are quite popular because they provide a valuable benefit to workers at a very low cost to firms or to universities. Okay, so the important thing here, again, just to re-emphasize re this, is all these policies are intended to do is change how we evaluate or measure productivity around the time of a birth. They're, they're not related to any sort of other reduction in workload. Oftentimes, universities also have policies that give new parents course release or something like that. These are independent of the policies that I'm gonna talk about. Um, to the best of our knowledge, course release policies are not correlated with the implementation of um, tenure clock stopping policies. Course relief policies also tend to be more on the departmental level than the university level, so they're pretty hard for us to measure. Um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna control for them because we can't actually observe um, policies that aren't on the books. We can't observe if your department chair is in control of whether or not you get course release is around the time of a birth. But to the extent that they're adopted at the university level, they're not correlated with the policies that I'm gonna look at. Okay, so to give you a bit of history, 
Um, as I said, the earliest policy, the tenure clock stopping policies were what I'm going to call female only policies. They only applied to birth mothers. Um, but over time, a gender neutral version started to become more common and is now much more common. A gender neutral version means that men and women get the same additional year on their tenure clock when they have a child, regardless of their actual time spent in child care. We're going to leverage in this paper um, the fact that these policies were rolled out across universities over a pretty long time horizon. As I said, the, the very earliest policies were in um, 1970 um, at two universities. We're going to leverage uh, implementation between the, the late 1980s and um, 2000s. And, and again, I'll show you a little bit later. There's a pretty constant rollout over this period. Um, in our sample of top 50 universities with PhD programs, 50% of the universities only ever have a gender neutral clock stopping policy. 20% switch at some point from a female only policy to a gender neutral version. Um, and then about 15% have a female only policy still today. And then a, about 15% don't ever adopt a policy in our sample period, um, which is gonna be 1980 through 2005. Okay, so in this paper, we're going to ask, do um, these policies work at increasing tenure rates? And then what we're really going to be interested in is how do specifically gender neutral tenure clock stopping policies that affect both men and women equally um, differentially affect the tenure outcomes of men and women? And what I'm going to show you and hopefully convince you is that these policies have a substantial increase in the probability that men get tenure in their first uh, tenure track job. At the same time, they substantially decrease the probability that women get tenure in their first job. Um, the main mechanism that I think uh, explains these differential effects for men and women is that the policies lead to an increase in the probability that men publish in top five journals before the tenure decision, but they lead to no statistically significant, at least change, and no positive change in the publication rates of women. Um, so so um, I'll go through uh, the, the estimation strategy and, and the data in more detail, but before I do that, I wanna start by walking you through some of the potential ways that these policies, these tenure clock stopping policies might work in theory, and why we might actually expect ex ante that they would have differential and potentially negative effects um, on women. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through two brief stories. Um, the first is a very simple story that tenure clock stopping policies don't change the productivity of assistant professors. They don't change the behavior of assistant professors in any way. All they do is change how assistant professors are evaluated when they come up for tenure. They change how we measure productivity. Okay. Um, and then I'll switch gears a little bit and tell you a story where these policies don't affect evaluation, but they change the behavior of assistant professors. And we'll think about the implications from, from both of these very stylized examples. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the premise that tenure in top departments is going to be based on almost entirely, if not entirely, on publication records. Um, assistant professors are more likely to get tenure if they publish more, and if they publish in better quality journals. Okay, and then for this story, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reemphasize the fact that in theory these policies are supposed to work um, by telling uh, tenure evaluators to discount the stop time. Okay, so tenure evaluator, evaluators are supposed to evaluate everyone based on a six-year tenure clock, regardless if the assistant professor gets six years or seven years or eight years. Um, but in practice, there's some pretty convincing evidence that this isn't true. Tenure evaluators, both are not told how they're supposed to be evaluating tenure cases, okay? So especially when um, departments call for outside recommendations, often those recommenders are not told how to account for the years that the clock was stopped. Also, both people as outside, in roles as an outside letter writer and within departments 
report that they explicitly ignore what they're told. They know best, okay? And this is maybe not surprising um, if, if you're an economist, but, but they report that, you know, they have, they think the world should work in some way and this is how people should be evaluated and they're going to evaluate people based on that uh, criteria regardless of, of whether or not they're explicitly told something different. So, you know, we'll start with this and then we'll, we'll relax that. So I want you to consider a very simple example where individuals come up for tenure um, and the tenure case is based on total output. And you can think of this as total output over the course of your career or total output per year as, as a rate. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter that much. We're going to assume that we have two candidates of equal ability. Um, and they both have a kid uh, prior to getting tenure, and they would have both had a kid prior to getting tenure, both in the absence of a clock stopping policy and with a clock stopping policy. So this is not going to change fertility behavior. It's not going to change productivity behavior. All the policy is going to do is change how evaluators decide whether or not someone gets tenure. So we have two candidates. They have equal ability. They both have a kid. Candidate A has a kid. She stops her tenure clock. And during that year that her tenure clock is stopped, or during the year her child is born, she does no research. Her productivity goes to zero. OK, so let's assume just for simplicity that you know, these equal ability candidates produce one paper a year, Okay, just to make it simple. So candidate A is going to go up for tenure. Her clock is supposed to be six years. Okay, if she gets a, uh, an extra year, she's going to have seven. Okay, so if she doesn't do any work in that extra year, it's going to look like she has six papers, right? She has six papers in six years. So she's going to look exactly the same as someone who didn't have a kid, who didn't get to stop their clock, um, but, but didn't have that year at zero productivity. So compared to a woman who didn't have a kid, she's not going to look any worse off. This policy is going to help her. In the absence of the tenure clock stopping policy, Candidate A would have still had the kid. She still would have not been productive in that year. And she would have looked like she had five years of productivity in six years. So compared to other similar women, she improves, right? The tenure clock stopping policy helps her. Excuse me. Yes. How do you count the productivity? In the year, uh, publication is important, or a person might have done a, a paper earlier and published in the year when she has taken the kind stuff, but how do you count that? Um, empirically, we're going to count um, publications in years since the PhD. Um, so in practice, what we care about is realized publication. So we're going we're gonna to look at, is your paper published by the time that you should have gone up for tenure? Yeah, and, and so we can't see in our data, um, we can't see whether or not you were close to having a publication. We're only going to be look, looking at realized publications, um, and we're going to allow them to be over the course of your, your career. So I'm sorry, just again, to yeah. this. it is, so it's actually when it appears in the journal or the acceptance date, I don't know the, yeah. whether the journals back then. Good question. Yeah, so we're going to use the year that it's published. So this is going to be measured with some error um, to the extent that there's a lag between acceptance and publication. Um, when I show you publication results, I'm going to show you um, a variety of years since PhD. So I'll show you what happens three years after your PhD, five years after your PhD, seven years, nine years. And so Part of the reason I'm going to do that is to account for this fact that we only observe the actual year it's published and not when it's accepted. Um, and it looks like that's not going to matter so much in our data, but, but it is a noisy measure of, of what you're actually being evaluated on at your tenure case. Do you have any, during the era you're looking at, do you have any, any sort of even anecdotal kind of evidence about what the lags were at the top five? That's a good question. I haven't looked at that specifically. Um, the lags have been, anecdotally, the lags have been, I have, so I haven't looked at specifically at top five journals. The, the lags have been long over this whole period. Um, I haven't seen any evidence that suggests the, the time to publication has really changed all that much. As the um, evaluation periods have gotten shorter, the requirements to, like, the requirements 
demands of referees have increased. In a, this is all anecdotal, um, which I think has kind of offset the like total production time to some extent. But I don't have good evidence on that. Um, I think some people at Berkeley are trying to get a bunch of old backlogged publication decision information from a couple of journals, so you could actually look at that. But I haven't seen anyone that can currently get at that. That's a good question. I can I can look into that. Okay. Um, so so here, you know, for this stylized example, we're just going to think of kind of ability and productivity perfectly correlating. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about issues with, with estimation of these things later. Um, so now think about another candidate. We'll call him candidate B. Candidate B stops his clock when he has a kid um, before tenure, but you know, he's not as involved in childcare. And, and for simplicity, in this very stylized example, we're going to assume he has no negative productivity shock associated with having a kid. His productivity remains constant in that extra year. And so now he's evaluated as if he's been at the, the university six years, but he actually has seven years of papers, right? He now looks relatively better than he would have before, OK? Now, he has seven publications in six years before he would have had six publications in six years. And you know the important point here is that even though in this simplified world, both men and women, or both candidate A and candidate B would be better off, candidate B is going to be relatively better off. He's going to look relatively more productive than candidate A when tenure clock stopping policies are available. Additionally, if tenure evaluators don't discount that extra year, then candidate A is going to look like she has six years of papers in seven years. And she's going to look relatively worse still than people that didn't get to stop their clock. And so even if these policies work exactly in the way they're intended, if there's no effects on the behavior of assistant professors, either through fertility or through productivity, we can still expect to see distributional consequences on who actually gets tenure. Even if these policies in absolute would be good for both men and women, if people are judged based on relative tenure standards, or if in some departments there's only a fixed number of tenure slots, then we're still going to see that women are going to look worse relative to men. Okay. Now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to say, okay, what if we don't we don't change how people are evaluated. Everyone's evaluated exactly the same. It, it's not going to matter. What if we now just change the behavior of individuals in response to having access to a clock stopping policy? So I want you to think about a simple environment. We have risk neutral assistant professors. They're endowed with some ability or some productivity, and that's going to translate into a paper of some quality. And their only decision as assistant professors in this very simple world is going to be where to submit their papers. Okay? I'm going to assume, as I said before, that tenure is based on an increasing function in both the number of papers that you publish and the quality of, of where those papers are published. So individuals are going to face a trade-off. Okay, they're going to have to decide whether they submit their papers to high quality journals with low acceptance rates or lower quality journals with higher acceptance rates. Okay, we can think of a menu of options here. I'm going to simplify this world into two types. You can send it to a high quality journal or a low quality journal. Okay, so we can think of this as kind of a one period game. Assistant professors are endowed with some papers. They decide where to send them. At the end of the period, the decisions come back. The papers are either published or they're not. Okay, so the probability that an assistant professor gets tenure is going to be a function of whether or not they publish their papers and, and where they publish them. Okay. And depending on the person's ability, right, which we can hold constant in our, our very simple example, they're going to have to decide whether or not it's worth the risk to send to the higher quality journal. Okay. So they're going to optimize. Based on this function, we can, we can solve this game, essentially. We're going to think of gender neutral clock stopping policies as providing a benefit by giving assistant professors a second period where they can try and publish their papers. And what this second period is going to do 
is it's going to make them engage in a more risky strategy early on. Okay? If they know they have a second chance to try again, they're going to be more willing to take risks and send to higher quality journals with low acceptance rates in that initial period. Because if they're unsuccessful, they can send it to the, the journal with the higher acceptance rate in the second period anyway. Okay. So in this setting, even if these policies don't change fertility, we might expect they change the publication strategies of assistant professor by removing some of the time cost associated with publishing. Why might there be a gender difference? Well, you might think that the value of that extra time is a function of the cost of childbirth or your productivity during the period of having a child. So the ability to try again is more valuable if you expect to have more time to try again. Okay? So again, you know, under a very stylized setting, we would expect these policies to lead to a gender difference if we're willing to assume that on average, the productivity costs associated with childbearing are higher for women than for men. Okay. So I could tell you a bunch of similar stories that all generate similar results. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. But I do want to outline, just kind of to summarize, the, the main ways that we would expect that these policies could influence the outcomes of assistant professors. So as I said, the extra time is valuable in that it may just give assistant professors more time to work and more time to publish. Okay? The extra time can increase the number of papers that you publish or that you write. And it can change your publication strategy. It can remove the time risk associated with making risky gambles. This is, especially in economics, where publication lags are quite long and, and the time it takes to get a decision on a paper uh, can be many, many months, uh, a very important benefit, potentially. If either of these things is true, if either tenure clock stopping policies increase the number of publications, or the quality of publications that some individuals produce, um, it may have an effect on departmental tenure standards. Okay, so yes, go ahead. Do female and male assistant professors tend to have kids around the same time in their mm -hmm. career? Yeah, so um, I will show you at the very end um, some evidence, some descriptive evidence on fertility that we um, obtained through surveys. So. It's descriptive in the sense that, that there are some sample selection issues um, that are not a problem in our main results. But a high proportion, about 85% of male and female assistant professors have a child within 10 years of their PhD. Um, about 30 to 40%, depending on the time period, so we're looking over 25 years, have a child before they should have gone up for tenure on the standard tenure clock. And the rates are really actually not very different for men and women, um, especially um, kind of outside of the, the early 80s. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking even sort of within the pre-tenure period, it might make a difference if you get kind of that extra year early. Versus yeah, yeah. Publication lives. Right. So, so the way this works is that you get the stopped year in the year your child is born, but in practice, it means that um, you just go up for one year, you go up for tenure one year later than you should have. Where it could matter is um, if having a kid essentially changes your expectations about the future. So you might essentially change your publication strategy early on um, if you have a kid early on. Um, whereas if you don't have a kid until year five, right, you have less time after that. What I would like to try and convince you of um, is that if this policy uh, affects the knowledge that you could have a kid in the future, maybe it doesn't actually matter so much, A, if you actually have a kid at all, Right, if you actually end up stopping your clock before tenure, or be the timing of when that child occurs. If you know that you could have a child before tenure if you need the extra time, it might be enough to change behavior regardless of when the actual fertility event occurs. Um, and there's, there's some, again, kind of descriptive uh, anecdotal evidence of that. So, um, a lot of people report, again, this, this is purely anecdotal, but a lot of people report thinking about the world in this way. They, 
you know, getting tenure is very valuable. It's a high risk game. The extra time can be a big help if you're kind of thinking you might be on the margin, right? You're not sure if a paper is gonna get published this year or not, or accepted this year or not. And so a lot of people report that they change the, they think about moving the timing of their fertility. They were gonna have a kid at some point near the tenure decision anyway. They report being willing to try to move the timing earlier in order to take advantage of that extra year. So for example, um, I was at the AEAs, the, the Economics Association Conference in January, and I was at a workshop on work-life balance for new, um, new faculty. And um, one of the, the senior women who came up told us a story about how she had recently gotten tenure. Her husband was, I think, in a different department, but an assistant professor. It looked like he was not kind of on track at that point to get tenure, so they started to try and have a kid. And so, you know, it, to some extent, it kind of seems unreasonable to think that this would be something that would change the timing of your fertility, but I think this is a high stakes game and that it is actually enough to make at least some fraction of assistant professors willing to do so. And if that's the case, again, all that matters is we're changing your expectations early on, and then the actual timing of when the child occurs is less important. Mm -hmm. So long as you know that you could potentially be willing to move to have a kid before tenure if you needed to stop your clock. So, so I think that, that really is the important point here. For us to expect to see effects of tenure clock stopping policies, we don't actually need to observe any change in fertility. We don't actually, in theory, need to observe any pre-tenure fertility at all, although the rates are fairly high, even in the absence of clock stopping policies. Um, they're even higher, as I'll show you, um, when clock stopping policies are available. But so long as you're willing to assume that people are willing to change their expectations about their potential future options in response to having access to these policies, we might expect them to have effects regardless of your eventual fertility outcomes. Okay. Um, so, you know, again, there's a large Reason, a number of reasons why we might expect these policies to affect men and women. And all of these reasons would suggest that if we're willing to assume that childbirth is more costly for women than for men, they would lead to gender differences in tenure rates. Okay. Um, so how are we actually going to evaluate these policies? So. The really cool part about this paper, I think, is that we've compiled two really unique data sets on assistant professors in economics. The first is a list of the tenure clock stopping policies and their adoption dates for 49 of the top 50 economics departments with PhD programs in the US. Um, we used kind of a standard ranking um, as of 2010. Uh, we're gonna be looking between 1980 and 2005 they're reasonably stable over time. Um, these rankings are never perfect, but you know, especially for the, the top 40 universities in our sample, it's, it's pretty stable over time. Um, I can show you just briefly the, the policies and, or the schools and their adoption dates. Um, so you can see here, this is I know kind of hard to read, but there's, there's a pretty good variation in the adoption dates over time. Um, Within our sample, the, the earliest were in about 88, and then there's a pretty um, good distribution across the 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, there are still some, some more adoptions outside of our sample um, still occurring today, but, but this is, is our sample of top universities. Okay. Um, the second data set is more interesting and, and really allows us to look at the effects of these policies. What we've done is we've collected the academic employment histories and publication records for every assistant professor hired at one of these 49 um, departments between 1980 and 2005. So over this 25 year period, we have a record for every assistant professor who shows up for at least one year at these 
these departments. Um, in total, that gives us about 1,600 assistant professors who were hired. For the results I'm going to show you today, we're going to use a sample of about 14, uh, 1,400. And we're going to make three main sample restrictions. The first is that we're going to require your first job, your first tenure track job, to be at one of the departments in our sample. And the reason for this is that we would like um, your productivity, your publication record, uh, over the course of your career to uh, reflect the time on your tenure clock. Is it over the course of your career or the time when they start the tenure track of five months? So we're going to... people who would be yeah. in two years. Uh, exactly. So we're going to largely limit the sample so those are the same thing. So this requirement that we're going to assume that you, you have, or we're going to limit the sample to only people in their first job is going to mean that we're not going to get people who restart their clock after three years, for example. So it's going to make the sample more homogenous in the correlation between your career and your time on the tenure clock. The other restriction we're going to make that's related to that point is we're going to limit the sample to jobs that start within two years of your PhD. So if you did something else for two years, like a postdoc, you're going to be excluded. Um, we can exclude everyone who doesn't start immediately after, it's, it's not going to matter. So we really are focusing on a group of people where productivity over your career and productivity during the period of your tenure clock are the same measure. And that's important for us because we don't know how you're evaluated if you restart your clock somewhere else, for example. Okay, the, the, um, this is, these are top 50 universities. Um, there is some mobility into the top 50, but not a whole lot. So these restrictions are actually not that important. In economics, and especially in this time period, postdocs were relatively uncommon. There really just aren't that many of them. The sample restriction that's going to matter more for us is this last one. We're going to limit the sample to people who publish at least two papers within eight years of completing their PhD. The actual requirements on this, whether we do two or one or eight or ten or whatever, don't actually matter. What this is really doing is it's getting rid of noise in our data generated by people who were never on track to get tenure under any circumstance. So we think tenure clock stopping policies should really only affect people who are to some degree on the margin of getting tenure. The people who don't publish, again this is a sample of top 50 universities, they all have high publication standards to get tenure. These are you know, 98% people who leave after one or two years. They go into their job, they decide they don't like it, they immediately or almost immediately leave for the private sector. So we could um, equivalently condition on staying in your first job for more than two years. That would be fine. The reason we don't do that is a lot of times for joint location issues or, or other reasons, people move within academic jobs and we don't really want to exclude them, although the results are, are robust to doing that as well. Okay, so I'll show you how the results change, change when we relax these restrictions and as you might expect, things get noisier. The, the results get a little bit smaller, but, but the story is largely the same. Okay, so to actually do this, um, we collected information from CVs and um, from uh, publication record databases. Um, so this is, uh, this is from CVs. We can't observe things like, um, did you have a paper R&R at the time you went for tenure, or how many working papers did you have at the time you went up for tenure? All we can observe is realized outcomes um, that are reported on the CV. Okay. So um, I'll show you a bunch of different outcomes today. The main outcome that I'm going to focus on is do you get tenure in your first job? Um, I'm going to refer to this as the policy university because this is going to be the university at which you're tied to a tenure clock stopping policy. So if you start your job at a university that has a tenure clock stopping policy in place, are you more or less likely to get tenure in that job? So it's just going to be an indicator for whether or not you get tenure. Um, additional outcomes that I'll show you will include um, publication counts, and I'll separate this into top five publications in economics. There are kind of five uh, general interest journals that we typically think of as the, the best journals to publish them, and then all other peer-reviewed journals. Um, I'll show you measures of 
um, whether or not these policies affect the probability that you get tenure in the profession. So at any college or university in the world, regardless of the rank. Um, I'll also show you some measures of time to tenure, both within your first job uh, and more broadly in the profession, and then the probability of moving to lower or higher ranked universities if you don't get tenure. Okay, and then I'll end um, with showing you some descriptive evidence on effects on fertility. Again, I want to emphasize that this fertility um, data is a little bit uh, of a, a lower quality because we can't see it on CVs. We don't have it for our entire sample. What we did was a survey um, of everyone in our sample for whom we could, we could find um, a valid contact information. And the, the response rate is not perfect. Um, so we think we have some selection issues. But I, I'll show you some descriptive evidence, at least. OK, sorry, this um, is not showing up terribly well. But before I turn to the, the regression specification, I just want to show you some descriptive trends in some of the outcomes that I'm going to look at. So this, um, these figures show um, the average number in this first panel, the average number of assistant professors hired in every year in our sample for both men. Men is the top line, the blue, and then women. And I really do apologize that these are hard to read, but the takeaway is many more men are hired as assistant professors in economics than women. Um, and though this gap has closed somewhat over time, there's still quite a large gap. The tenure rates are also very different between men and women. Men are much more likely to get tenure um, than are women. And these figures are just the raw data. They don't distinguish between universities with and without policies, for example. Um, and we also see gaps, um, gender gaps, in the average number of top publications published by the time you go up for tenure and the average number of non-top five publications. And so the thing I want to point out here before turning to the empirical specification is that both um, within universities and across universities, there are level differences in outcomes between men and women. And it also looks like, again, here is just the average, but across universities, there are differential time trends between 1980 and 2005 between men and women. And so that's going to be important um, for us to control for in the empirical specification. So how do we estimate um, the effect of gender-neutral tenure clock-stopping policies on tenure outcomes? We're going to use um, a fairly simple panel model leveraging the fact that different universities implement these tenure clock-stopping policies and different types of tenure clock-stopping policies at different points in time. Okay, so this is going to be essentially like a diff and diff model, except instead of having treatment turn on for everyone at the same time, treatment is going to turn on at different times in different universities. Okay, so Y here is going to be the outcome of individual I of gender G who starts their job at University U in year T. And we're going to have an indicator, GN, for whether or not there's a tenure clock, a gender neutral tenure clock stopping policy in place uh, at the time that they start their job. So when they come in, can they expect that they could take advantage of this policy if they have a kid in the future? So our two coefficients of interest here are going to be beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 1 is go going to give us the effect of gender neutral tenure clock stopping policies on men. And then beta 2 is going to interact this with women and be the additional effect of the gender neutral policies for women. Um, so in the results, I'm going to show you the, the sum of these two coefficients, beta 1 plus beta 2, and then I'll also show you beta 2. OK? FO is equivalently an indicator for universities that have a female-only policy, so a policy that only applies to women. Um, so I'll show you results for that as well. And because many of the stories I told you about how these policies work rely on changing expectations or changing norms over time, I'm going to allow the effects to differ in the very early years of these policies. So um, beta 3 and beta 4 and beta 7 and beta 8 are just going to interact the treatment effects with an indicator for um, equal to 1 if the policy is very new, if the policy was implemented zero to three, um, if you start your job zero to three years after the policy was implemented. Part of this is because when a policy shows up on the books and when 
people become aware of it might actually not be the same. Part of this is because we think that there might be um, a problem with individuals not wanting to be a first mover. No one wants to be the first person in their college or in their um, university to take advantage of a new policy. And part of this is also, of course, that we would expect the effects to grow over time if they're driven in part by changing department tenure standards, for example. So I'll show you both the results in the early years and then the, the longer term effects. These um, regressions are also going to control for a limited number of individual level controls, including where you got your PhD, whether or not you published during grad school as kind of a measure of quality or ability, um, and uh, whether or not you did a postdoc, although again, it, that's pretty rare in this sample period. Um, I'll also include some time-varying university controls for things like uh, university revenue, the size of the undergraduate population, um, the number of faculty in the university as a whole, and the gender ratio of faculty in the university. Um, so are some universities just likely to hire more women than not, uh, or than men? Um, and then we'll also include gender-specific time trends and gender gender-specific university fixed effects. And again, these gender-specific trends are, are important because we see level differences both within and across universities. And, and the time effects are going to pick up if there are differences within universities over time between men and women. Okay. So here are the main results. This table shows the effect of clock stopping policies on the probability that individuals uh, get tenure at the policy university, at the university at which they start their first job. So this first panel shows these early term effects. Um, if you start your job zero to three years after a policy is adopted, and we really don't see anything. So this um, first uh, column gives you the effects of the main effects for men and women of gender neutral policies. They're not significant, they're pretty small. This is the, the gender difference. Okay, if we look in the long run, if we look at the effects um, after a few years have passed, we see a pretty different story. This um, says, in this red box, says that when men are exposed to a gender neutral tenure clock stopping policy at the time they were hired, that's been in place for a few years, they're 17 percentage points more likely to get tenure than they would have been at the same university in the absence of the tenure clock stopping policy. So these are pretty big effects. Um, this coefficient right here says that when women are exposed to a gender neutral policy, they're about 19 percentage points less likely to get tenure than they would have been compared to other women in um, the absence of the clock stopping policy. Yes. So just so I, I understand, the point one seven six is beta one. Yes. And point three seven always point is beta two. This is beta two, and then this is the sum. Yeah. yeah. Or the difference. Sorry. Yeah. And so does this affect the people who use the clock stopping policy, or just? No. This is the intent to treat effect. Okay. So um, I'll show you effects on time to tenure. Um, and fertility, and that's kind of the best we can get at who actually uses the policy. And when I show you that, I'll talk in more detail about why we actually don't want to look at specifically people who look like they're taking the clock extension. Just kind of to summarize, one reason is that if you don't think you're going to get tenure, in economics, there's a strong incentive to move early and not actually go up for tenure. And so we don't want to base this on whether or not you go up for tenure or whether or not you take a clock, you stay longer than the typical time on the clock, because that could be a response, an endogenous response to these policies. And I'll show you that. Similar, we don't want to look at just people that have kids before tenure because we think that these policies could work through changing your behavior if you expect that you could have kids before tenure if you wanted to or if you needed to. Um, so these are intent to treat effects, but we don't want you to interpret them as intent to treat effects in the traditional sense where you could scale them up and get the, the true treatment, treatment on the treated effect. We think that potentially here everyone is somewhat treated, right? Everyone has the potential to stop their clock if they wanted to, if they had a kid. 
of course, not all people are going to, to consider that option, but um, we, can't, we can't see that. So you should think of these um, as intent to treat effects where the entire population could be treated. Okay, the other interesting thing to point out, the gender gap grows considerably. These policies did not work in closing the gender gap. Regardless if you believe um, the magnitude of these estimates, and I'll, I'll show you some robustness um, to address that, but regardless of whether or not you believe the magnitudes, it's very clear these policies did not decrease the gender gap in tenure rates. Okay. Um, at the same time, it doesn't look like female-only policies, policies that only applied to women, had any positive or negative effects. Um, as you would expect, female-only policies do not affect men. This is pretty close to zero. Um, they have small positive effects on women. They're never significant. The effects of female-only policies are never significant. Um, Part of that, I think, is because um, anecdotally we have some pretty good evidence that women across disciplines um, were discouraged from using female-only policies. They were explicitly told by um, their department chairs or told more casually by other senior colleagues that it would look like a negative signal if they extended their tenure clock and they were, advised, they were not advised to do so. Um, and so if women can't take advantage of the policy, you would not expect the policy to work. Um, but in any case, I'm gonna focus on the gender neutral effects because we're interested in what happens to the gender gap and um, we really don't see any convincing evidence that female only policies worked. Okay. Um, in order to uh, believe that these estimates are the causal impacts of clock stopping policies, you need to believe that universities that adopt these policies are similar to universities who don't adopt these policies. In other words, department hiring decisions or department tenuring decisions um, are not uh, different between universities who adopt and universities who do not adopt these policies. What's really nice for us um, to address this concern is that we're looking specifically in economics departments and these policies are adopted at the university level. So it seems highly unlikely that universities would adopt these policies in response to trends in tenure rates in the economics department in particular. But you still could be concerned that they adopt these policies in response to trends across the university um, that mirror trends or that are similar to trends in economics. So we can do um, an event study like specification where we essentially estimate the effects in pre periods. I'm not going to show you a true event study where we estimate effects in every year um, because we don't have enough data to do so. And particularly, we don't have enough data on women. Um, but I am going to show you an event study specification where we control for bins of pre policy years. And this, I apologize, is more blurry than on my screen. Um, but the point is, we don't see any evidence of trends, of pre-trends in tenure rates between men and women, or the gender gap in tenure rates, uh, prior to the implementation of these policies. And when we control for these pre-period indicators, it doesn't really change the policy effects. We get very similar point estimates for the effects of the policies after policy adoption. So it doesn't look like our identification assumptions are violated. I can show you a bunch of um, alternative specifications to try and convince you that these results are robust. They're not a function of how we've estimated the model. Um, I've just shown you the, the longer term effects here to, to reduce the number of coefficients. The first column is the baseline specification. Um, we can exclude uh, some of the controls, nothing really changes. We can remove the sample restrictions so we can include these people who were really probably never on the margin of getting tenure, or whose productivity um, is not necessarily correlated to the, the time spent at the university. And um, the point estimates are pretty similar. We lose precision here, but, but we still see this big gender gap. Um, 
We can allow top departments and non-top departments to be on different trends over time. If you think that top departments are just different somehow, nothing really changes. Um, we can remove the gender-specific fixed effects. Uh, and this is the specification that does change. We lose the negative effect for women. I don't, but we still have a gender gap. Um, I don't think this is surprising, given that women are a very small share of the assistant professors in our sample. They're, they're about 20% of our sample or less um, in this period, over this period. And so these trends are driven by men, right? We do know there are trends in tenure rates and publication rates over time. And to the extent that men and women are on different trends, then assigning the male trend to women is, is going to affect the results. Um, but, but again, even if you don't believe that the effect on women is truly negative, we still see an increase in the gender gap. Oh, sorry. So are they, uh, I mean, between the, the, the pre-trends and the top publication mechanism you'll show for, for, for men, I'm, yeah, I'll I'm, show not, you so, I'm, not, I'm not so skeptical of this. My question is, how are, are universities uh, adopting these gender-neutral tenure clock stopping policies in bundles with oh, sort, yeah. of, sort, sort mm -hmm. of other things? That's a really that good could, question. That could, yeah. draw, that could have yeah. the, it, it, the reason why I'm skeptical of my own question is yeah. sort of thinking about how those policies would yeah. lead to these. So one threat, for example, is if universities adopted both tenure clock stopping policies and course release policies at the same time, and maybe this effect is not driven by the additional time on the tenure clock, it's driven by that other policy. Um, to the best of our knowledge, that's not the case. We've looked extensively. One problem is that universities don't really keep very good records about policy changes. So. Um, we managed to get documentation of the tenure clock stopping policies. Um, we tried to get documentation of other policies adopted at the same time. They don't look like they're correlated. Like we looked for um, changes in um, course release policies. We looked for changes in paid or unpaid leaves. Um, neither of those, at least the official policy on the books, is correlated with the timing of these policies. To the extent that they're not on the books, um, you might still be concerned about that, but, but they, at least at the university level, are not correlated. In fact, there's actually very few universities that implement these things at the same time. The, the leave in particular um, really comes through the FMLA in 1993. Um, so FMLA says you have to give uh, birth mothers um, uh, 12 weeks of uh, unpaid time off. With um, teaching, it's hard to give people part of a term, part of a semester off. So a lot of times they, they implemented um, paid leave or course release or stuff in, in conjunction with that. And I think because it was largely tied to the FMLA, it, it's not correlated with these policies. But, but that is a concern. Um, I'll show you, uh, I'm going to run out of time, but I'll hopefully very quickly flash a slide that shows you these policies aren't correlated with other university characteristics or changes in university characteristics over time as well. And then finally, um, we can control for endogenous things like publication records and uh, fertility for kids before tenure. Um, and as you would expect, the, the coefficients are attenuated. Um, which suggests these are relevant explanations. Okay, so I um, am behind, uh, unsurprisingly, but uh, very quickly I want to show you effects on some other labor market outcomes, and in particular, even though these policies reduce the probability that women get tenure in their first job um, at the first university that they show up at, they're no less likely to get tenure at any college or university in the world. Um, so this, um, this is at any point over their career. Um, so this does suggest, I think, that um, you know, it's not that women fail and then immediately move into the private sector or something. They, they are persisting in academia. They're just moving to different types of universities. Okay. Um, we see that uh, men who uh, have access to gender neutral policies are more likely uh, to take longer on their tenure clock than they should. 
Um, we see the same effect for women, the same point estimate, but it's not significant. Um, but we do see them likely to, to take the extra time. We also see them more likely to leave before the, the standard time of the tenure decision. Again, suggesting that people are optimizing if it really doesn't look like they have a chance to get tenure. Um, it does appear that they're leaving. Um, it takes women longer to get tenure um, any, at any college or university, in part because they're less likely to get tenure in the first try. Um, but what's kind of interesting is that they're actually less likely, conditional on not getting tenure in their first job, they're actually less likely to move to a lower tiered university. This is really noisy. It's hard to assign universities to tiers. But what you would expect if women um, start having more kids and are just inherently less productive, you would think that they would move to lower ranked universities. And that really doesn't appear to be the case. So um, since I'm out of time, I'm going to go, I just want to show you, we do see, um, effects on uh, top publication rates for men. And consistent with a story where men start to change their behavior early on, sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't, we see that men around year five start to have higher rates of, um, or higher probabilities of having top five publications. These are rates, not, not probabilities. Um, and then it stabilizes around the 10-year decision. If we look more than nine years later, we don't see any additional increase. Um, at the same time, we don't see positive effects for women. If anything, they might be slightly negative, but they're small and pretty noisy. What we do see is that maybe, again, they're pretty noisy, but maybe women are a little bit less productive overall. Maybe they have about one less publication over the course of their pre-tenure period. This is pretty consistent with the evidence we find on fertility. Again, as I said, this is survey data. Um, I don't want to interpret this as causal. But if we just look at the difference in means and the probability of giving birth prior to tenure um, between men who have access to a clock stopping policy and those who don't, we see an increase. This is the, the mean, not the increase. Um, and the stars indicate the, the significant difference in means. We see the same increase for women, although it's not significant for the probability of having at least one kid. We do see a significant increase in the number of kids pre-tenure. Um, and the same for female-only policies, except they're pretty noisy. The last two columns show the probability of ever having a child um, before and after tenure and the total number of children ever born. Um, we don't see significant differences. This does appear to be a change in the timing. OK, so that's all. Um, just very briefly to conclude, these policies um, did not work as they were intended. Uh, they lead to higher tenure rates for men, largely driven by an increase in male publishing, and lower tenure rates for women. Um, this implies that when we think about policies aimed at helping new parents, and especially aimed at helping new mothers, we need to adequately account for the gender-specific productivity costs of having kids. I'm going to end with that, except to caveat that to say that I don't want you to walk away from this saying that we should necessarily get rid of these policies right now. These results may be specific to economics. There's a no large number of reasons that are listed in the paper that explain why economics could be different than other fields. And I think we really need more work um, on these types of policies to know whether or not the results are driven by the particular characteristics of the tenure process in economics or if they'd hold more generally. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you, the, your chart shows the average number of publications uh, in the seventh year. Uh huh. Now, did you did you calculate that for the ones who got tenure for men and women? This is everyone. We, I think, have done it for just people that get tenure. And um, they are still different. Yeah, m women seem to have lower publication counts across the board. But I will say that you know this is just a count of any peer-reviewed publication. And some other work um, suggests that women tend um, to have more or to have fewer publications of relatively higher field level quality, whereas men tend to have more 
very low publication quality publications. So if that's true, and again, we don't, we haven't looked at that, but, but other work on publication records has, um, if that's true, then you don't want to interpret this as just a productivity effect. It might have some quality component as well. Uh, that's, that's not immediately obvious. Well, I was getting at the point that possibly uh, tenure committees make some allowance. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. the standards might be both. Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we can we can control in our regressions for the number of publications, and then we kind of pick that up um, to the extent that we don't, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. Particularly when you consider the citations. Mm, yeah. Small publications may have higher than the. Yeah, yeah, and and citations do matter as well in tenure. Yeah. We better have the chat just because it's yeah, such a said, class. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you everybody for coming. Just so you know, there will not be a seminar next week. Our next seminar is in two weeks, but between now and that seminar, um, there are more seminars in the economics department from, from uh, visiting job candidates uh, over the next few weeks. So if you need your fill. There are between there are two more seminars between uh, now and the next one. <laughs>